Welcome to this experimental policy forum gathering of experts of the Washington Institute to discuss the current crisis between Hamas and Israel, the rocket barrage, the conflict emerging in the Middle East. I'm delighted to be joined here by um, first Mike Herzog, uh, former Brigadier General Advisor to five Ministers of Defense, um, joining us from Israel. Here in Washington, my colleagues, Ambassador Dennis Ross, who uh, served as Special Middle East Envoy and high levels and, and uh, five presidential administrations. Um, he is our Davidson Distinguished Fellow. And David Pollack, um, longtime State Department official, currently our Kaufman Fellow here at the Institute. I'm first going to turn to you, Dave Pollack. You just concluded a very original and provocative set of polls working with Palestinian pollster to give us insight and context into Palestinian attitudes just on the eve of the current conflict. What are Palestinians thinking? I would say the results uh, fall into two categories, good news and bad news. The bad news is that on long-term issues of peace with Israel, the popular support among Palestinians in the West Bank and in Gaza for a two-state solution, in other words, for lasting peace with Israel, is now a minority view in, among the Palestinian public. Only about 30 percent overall support a two-state solution. And a majority supports reclaiming all of Palestine, in other words, eliminating Israel, uh, with another 10 percent or so saying they want a one-state solution in which Arabs and Jews would have equal rights in historic Palestine, a binational state. That's the bad news. The good news, though, is very striking, and it is that a majority of Palestinians overall, and especially Palestinians in Gaza, do not want violence against Israel. They wanted Hamas explicitly to observe a ceasefire with Israel. They wanted peaceful resistance, not armed resistance against Israeli occupation. And popular support for Hamas in Gaza is at record low levels. The two top Hamas leaders put together got a total of 15 percent popular support among their own public in the Gaza Strip. And Fatah leaders, including Mohammed Abbas, uh, Mahmoud Abbas himself, got much more popular support. So I would say on long-term issues, the Palestinian public is very disillusioned with the whole idea of peace with Israel. But when it comes to the current situation, they don't want violence. They don't want rockets. They don't want Hamas. And that, I think, has very important implications for what's going on between Israel and Hamas right now. Mike, uh, we just heard that perhaps it's a result of Hamas weakness, um, of a successful policy of squeezing Hamas, that Hamas has launched this, uh, this blizzard of attacks on Israel. Uh, currently, um, how do you see the forces arrayed? Uh, what do you think Israeli strategy is at the moment? Um, how would you assess the overall military state of play? This is the fourth day to Israel's uh, operation to stop the firing of rockets. Uh, on average, Hamas is firing about 100 rockets a day into Israel, and uh, Israel is conducting airstrikes uh, against Hamas military infrastructure, underground launchers, heavy rockets, tunnels, storage facilities, production facilities, and so on. Now, I believe that this could uh, go on for a while for two major reasons. The one is that Israel and Hamas have very different pictures of how they see this ending. Hamas would like to extricate uh, itself from a very low point, politically, financially, and so on, and to show resistance, to inflict damage, and ultimately uh, to get better terms, like the opening of Rafa, uh, some prisoners and the likes. I think Israel's uh, goal right now is uh, ultimately to establish a, a, as long and stable ceasefire as possible without paying any price to Hamas, no, price for, uh, no reward for violence, 
and while inflicting <clears throat> uh, heavy damages on its military infrastructure. Now, this may take a while because uh, to synchronize those two pictures, I think they have to suffer uh, sufficient blows in order to, to ask for a ceasefire. The second complication is that there is no effective mediating mechanism right now. I mean, the Egyptians are in the picture, but reluctantly, and they don't have the same impact on Hamas as they used to, given the relations. So I believe Israel will continue uh, striking from the air <clears throat> in order to degrade Hamas capabilities and motivation. But if Israel doesn't succeed in getting a ceasefire in a few days or signs that they, are, uh, they want a ceasefire, then I, I believe we are nearing a, a decision point about uh, a ground operation, whether or not to launch a ground operation. It's not the first preference of our government. Nobody is, is rushing there. But again, <clears throat> if air strikes, air strikes uh, prove insufficient, or if they inflict damage on us or casualties, then I believe the pressure on the government will mount. And uh, I would, certainly wouldn't rule out a ground operation. If Israel does decide about a ground operation, I believe the likely goal will be <clears throat> to uh, hit as hard as possible their heavy military infrastructure, uh, betting on the fact that their weakness, together with Egypt's role in, uh, in, in closing the border, could make it very hard for them over time to rebuild their capabilities. Dennis, let me turn to you to discuss the diplomatic uh, environment in which all of this is operating, and especially to explain uh, the, uh, the injection for the first time of President Obama into this diplomacy uh, via phone call with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister just yesterday. This is not like 2012, where you had an Egyptian government led by the Muslim Brotherhood that was extremely anxious to contain this, uh, and therefore not only had an interest in containing it, but also had enormous leverage because they were like the senior brother to the junior brother of Hamas. The US at that time, particularly in the form of Secretary Clinton, worked very closely uh, with the Egyptian government, which was using its military intelligence channels with the Israelis to try to negotiate something. Uh, and we were, in a sense, a, in a sense, it, we helped provide a mechanism to sort of work this out. Now we don't have quite the same options. First, because as Mike was saying, the Egyptian government doesn't have the same kind of interest, doesn't have the same kind of relationship, although I would argue they still have a lot of leverage. Uh, I do believe that the president was speaking to the prime minister in part to show support for Israel at a time when it's receiving rockets, but also to discuss with him what the U.S. might do with the Egypt Egyptians or perhaps with others, including the Turks, under what circumstances the Israelis could accept certain kinds of outcomes. Uh, and I th think he was trying to get a feel for what Israel could live with, what they couldn't live with. Uh, what the time frame was, what kind of pressures Israel was under. And I think that discussion was geared towards expressing some of our own concerns about where this would go and what the end state might be, but also designed to uh, have a conversation about what we might do with the Egyptians and others and how the Israelis might respond to it. And I think we're probably still searching for what are the right ways and who, in fact, may be the right, uh, who might have the right forms of leverage to affect Hamas behavior other than what Israel itself is doing. Dennis, how do you connect that diplomatic timetable with the timetable that Mike Herzog just laid out for the possible um, ground invasion of Israeli troops into Gaza? I think the key is very much uh, what is Egypt prepared to do? What are they prepared to say to Hamas? Hamas at this point has, as Mike said, a desire to point to some achievements. Ironically, Egypt could help provide the, an achievement, at least with regard to Rafa. Egypt's own incentive for doing that may not be so great unless somehow it is tied to the U.S. relationship. Getting to your question, I think if the U.S. right now, realizing that there should be a sense of urgency, given the kind of clock as it's ticking within Israel, were to go to the Egyptians and say, this is the moment to go there and to make it very clear that you're prepared 
to work to get the Israelis to stop, provided Hamas will stop. Uh, and you might even be, I would I would suggest the Egyptians don't talk about opening Rafah, other than to say you might be prepared to discuss that, uh, discuss the possibility of opening Rafah, but that Hamas has no prospect of being rescued by Egypt unless they're prepared to stop the rocket fire. I think that should be the character of the conversation that we have with the Egyptians in terms of the message they have to Hamas. But also, I think we should be making clear to Egypt that we see them playing a central role here. Sisi will draw the appropriate conclusion from that in terms of the implications for the U.S.-Egyptian relationship. Just to uh, explain to our viewers, Dennis is referring to the Rafah border crossing between Gaza and Egyptian Sinai, which is currently closed, um, meaning that there's no exit for any Palestinians to go south. Uh, complementing the fact that there's no exit for them to go in the other direction into Israel. Um, Egypt's opening and closing of this is a main lever that the Egyptians have over um, the Gazans. So, Mike, let me come back to you for a minute. Um, there, uh, there has been remarkable scenes on television of the effectiveness of the Iron Dome system. Uh, the Palestinians, the, the Hamas, uh, seem to be trying to um, work around this with massive volleys of uh, of rockets to overwhelm the Iron Dome. Um, how has that tactic been uh, successful or not? And um, uh, how is the Israeli public dealing, um, as you say, four days now um, into this operation? Well, uh, Iron Dome is proving highly effective, <clears throat> uh, even more effective than in 2012. Then its success rate was about 84%. Now it's about 90% because uh, there were some improvements. And it deals quite well with the massive salvos that they are trying to, uh, uh, to send on to Israel. Uh, it also, I think, provides our public with a sense of uh, confidence. Uh, it allows for the continuation of normal life. It's true that it, from time to time this is disrupt, uh, disrupted when sirens go on and we all have to go to shelters, but generally speaking, people live their lives because of Iron Dome. It provides our decision makers with more, uh, more flexibility, more room, uh, less pressure uh, to make a hasty uh, decision. Uh, that said, Iron, Chrome, uh, Iron Dome is not uh, 100%, it's not foolproof, and uh, there's still a chance that Hamas could bypass it and inflict damages. So if Hamas continues to fire averagely 100 rockets a day for, uh, for uh, <clears throat> in the coming days, or if they manage to inflict damages on us uh, or casualties, I believe uh, that will uh, hasten the moment where when our government has to make a decision. And we, Israel is making all the preparations. We are recruiting reservists, making all the plans. Um, and, and it's certainly possible that if we don't achieve a ceasefire within a week or maybe a bit more, then Israel will make that decision. Dave Pollack, let me turn to you and ask you about the other main Palestinian actor, and that's Mahmoud Abbas, the head of the Palestinian Authority. Um, has he played a role throughout this conflict? Um, is he relevant? What has been his strategy uh, with all the focus on uh, Hamas and Gaza? I think he's very relevant, although he's not effective. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that what he says is very important just in terms of messaging to the American government and to the Israeli government and to the publics on, in both of those places and to the Palestinian and the broader Arab public, even if what he says doesn't actually produce a real effect in stopping the violence or reducing it. So in the first few days, Abbas uh, made some what I think were really quite unhelpful, even inflammatory comments saying that uh, the Palestinians had every right to defend themselves, as he put it, by firing rockets into Israel, accusing Israel of war crimes and even genocide, and hinting that he would take Israel to the, if he could, to the International Criminal Court for its retaliatory air raids against Hamas and Gaza. That was the first few days. 
in the second two days, uh, yesterday and today, Abbas is taking a, a, a totally different tone. He is saying that he supports a ceasefire, that he's doing everything he can to achieve a ceasefire, that Hamas is the one who is rejecting a ceasefire. He is saying that he, again, repeating that he does not believe in violence, that it does not serve the Palestinian cause, that he wants all violence to stop. And he is saying this not just in English or in Arabic to American or Israeli audiences, but in Arabic on Palestinian official television to Palestinian and a broader Arab audience. Uh, although it's hard to tell because from day to day, as this demonstrates, he can change his position. But it seems to me that he has changed his mind in a relatively serious way now to conclude that Hamas is just not a reliable partner and that his effort to build a unity government backed by Hamas, in which, as he said, Hamas would agree to renounce violence, or at least to refrain from violence against Israel, that that effort is a failure, and that Hamas bears the sole responsibility for that. So he is now trying to play the role, at least rhetorically, but it's very important uh, for the atmospherics of this conflict, of a peacemaker, and uh, resuming his view that violence is not good for Israel, but also not good for the Palestinians themselves. And I would say one more thing about this, which is very significant. In the West Bank, where Abbas does exercise significant, uh, actually dominant control over the reality on the ground, unlike in Gaza, in the West Bank, there is generally an atmosphere of quiet and calm. There are no major riots or demonstrations or anti-Israeli violence. And that is because, again, I think Abbas and his government has made a very important decision that they do not want to escalate the situation. Dennis, um, uh, the entire Gaza issue and the rocket uh, conflict is not the only thing going on in the Middle East and not the only thing um, on the uh, Obama administration's Middle East agenda, let alone global agenda. Uh, the uh, success of ISIS in Iraq, the Iran nuclear negotiations are coming to a head uh, in the next 10 days. How does the Obama administration prioritize and deal with it? Does it even have the bandwidth to address this range of issues? It's an excellent question, just given the reality. Secretary Kerry was in Kabul trying to see if he could work out an understanding about how to deal with the election results uh, and with Abdullah Abdullah claiming fraud and not being prepared to accept the, the results. At the same time, he's now joining all the foreign ministers uh, of the five plus one, the current five members of the Security Council plus Germany, uh, in Vienna for, for talks, which apparently the reason for this is to show that the five plus one is taking, is going the extra mile to see if they can try to salvage these negotiations before July 20th. So he at least is clearly very active. I would also say my impression is he's also been on the phone himself with both the Prime Minister of Israel and with uh, Mahmoud Abbas. And I do believe that, that some of the reasons that uh, the Abbas public posture has changed is some of the some of the conversations from here, and I think some of the unhappiness that was expressed about some of his early statements. And it was probably not only what we were saying to him, but I think what some of the Europeans were saying to him as well. So there is an awful lot going on. The question of bandwidth is is an appropriate one, but administrations have to deal with with these realities. It, unfortunately, for the Obama administration. It's facing a level of turmoil and upheaval in the Middle East that really is unprecedented. Clearly, we have an interest in trying to see if what's going on right now uh, in this current conflict is one that can be contained uh, and with an outcome that doesn't just recreate it all over again within a few months' time. I mean, I think the idea that you're trying to recreate the status quo ante is a prescription for ensuring you have to deal with this again in a few months' time. It is true that uh, what Mike Herzog was saying, if Israel could 
destroy most of the, the rocket firing infrastructure, the rocket making infrastructure, given Egypt's new posture towards Gaza, the ability to reconstitute that capability would be far more difficult. And you really could not just affect Israel's deterrence, but you could actually affect the Hamas capabilities. And I think that is, we, we should be focused on an outcome that doesn't leave us in a situation where we're simply dealing with this all over again. If I could ask one question of Mike, Mike, I know you've talked about the pressures that could build on Israel to go in on the ground. One question I have is how much can Israel do from the air to set back the Hamas infrastructure uh, for making rockets uh, and for being able to fire them? Well, Israel is doing a lot uh, in that sense, and we are targeting uh, their infrastructure, both uh, production facilities and storage facilities, but uh, that has a limit. And the reason is that uh, a lot of their infrastructure is hidden underground, in deep tunnels or uh, underneath uh, high rising buildings. And of course, you don't want to target them because of the collateral damage. So for Israel to be really effective in setting, uh, setting them back a long way, uh, we'll ultimately have to do it only through a ground operation if we are compelled to do one. <clears throat> Talking about the ground operation, in 2012, when Israel recruited 75,000 reservists and deployed them around Gaza, that, coupled with elsewise, convinced Hamas to go for a ceasefire. But that ceasefire uh, held for a, a bit more than a year and a half compared to Kastled, which held for nearly four years. So uh, the more effective we are, the longer the ceasefire is, but that comes with a political price. I need to ask all of you um, to offer, well, if not a prediction, at least a prognostication. So how does this end? Mike, let's start with you. I think it's not going to be a short confrontation. It'll take some time could be measured in, in weeks. Uh, I think there is high likelihood that Israel will have to launch a ground operation. I'm not sure, but it's like 50-50 if I had to bet right now. Uh, and I believe that as far as the ceasefire terms are concerned, we'll probably go back to similar terms. The question is, is there any way to exact a political price from Hamas? And here, I would think about additional ways for example, we mentioned the Rafah crossing and we talked about uh, Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, I would think about a station where the Egyptians open it only on condition that the PA controls it and Hamas doesn't control it at all. So you do something for the population, but Hamas loses politically. Um, and there are other ways that we can think about it, but I don't think it's good for us to go back to exactly the same, state, same status quo because that would mean that there's, it's only a lull in a long uh, confrontation, and we we'll just have to count the days until the next round. Thank you. Uh, Dave? I think it's the ending, uh, unfortunately, is likely to be inconclusive, both from a military and from a political standpoint. Uh, in other words, leaving Hamas in control of Gaza and leaving it with at least some significant potential to rearm and to do this all over again um, sometime in the future. Um, however, I think that there are a few things that could be salvaged, at least politically, from this. Number one is uh, it might be possible to encourage Abbas to uh, formally give up on the idea of unity with Hamas. Number two, I, I would follow up maybe a little more explicitly with uh, something that I think Dennis was suggesting, which is that if Egypt is helpful in um, brokering a ceasefire and then some new arrangements um, in Gaza and at Rafah, then this is a great opportunity for the American government to fully embrace Sisi and his government and to provide them with the aid and the weapons that they need in order to conduct their overall counterterrorism policy, in, which is in our own interest as well, more effectively. It's 
similar in a way, ironically, to what happened with Sisi's predecessor in Egypt, Mohamed Morsi, when he brokered a ceasefire uh, with Hamas uh, and Israel um, in November of 2012, and was then uh, embraced quite warmly by the U.S. government as a result. That was a mistake, but I think with Sisi, it won't be a mistake. Um, and third, from the Hamas standpoint, my impression is that uh, from looking at Hamas propaganda, uh, official videos um, and uh, their website just this morning, uh, El Aqsa TV website and so on, that uh, Hamas is actually in a mood uh, to just keep going and is not interested in um, a, a quick ceasefire. So it's not just from Israel's standpoint or Egypt's or the US or the PA. I think Hamas, at least the, the people who control, who call the shots literally in Hamas right now, despite what their own people want, Hamas is determined to keep firing rockets into Israel. And that's the sticking point that uh, all of us are going to have to contend with. Dennis, your own view. I, too, think this is going to drag on for a while. Uh, I don't think that Hamas can be easily uh, dissuaded at this point. Uh, I, I am not hopeful that uh, Egypt is going to exert that much leverage in the near term. They may be prepared to do it as time goes by. I don't think Egypt is particularly concerned if Hamas suffers some serious bet setbacks within Gaza. They might actually favor that. I think there will be Israeli ground operations into Gaza, although I don't think they're necessarily going to involve a massive invasion and effort to occupy Gaza. I think they'll be more selective in terms of the targets and the, and the locations. Uh, and I do think in the, the end of the day, when this comes to an end, uh, there, there could be some things we could do along the lines of what Mike was suggesting with regard to if you want Rafa open, the PA has to be there. I would even take it one step further. I would like to suggest to the Egyptians that the Egyptians host an event with the Saudis themselves, the Jordanians, and maybe the Emiratis with Abu Mazen, where they say it's very clear to them that if there's going to be a future for the people of Gaza, it needs to be with the PA in control. This would be another way to further delegitimize or undermine Hamas's claims of any success in the aftermath of this. I think one of the outcomes has to be to make Hamas claims of victory appear uh, not just in words, but in reality to be very hollow. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, one last sort of editorial comment from me. This is um, another, just the most recent, major test in my view of American leadership and the ability of the United States to rise to the occasion um, with bold, forceful leadership to bring about a better outcome than the situation that it inherits. Um, I would like to see an outcome which um, degrades significantly Hamas's missile capability. If we could dismantle Syria's chemical weapons, why shouldn't one of the goals of this operation being to dismantle Hamas's um, rocket capability? I would like to see, as my colleagues just said, an outcome which uh, deepens the U.S.-Egyptian relationship, at least on a strategic level, without derogating our right to speak forcefully about the human rights uh, situation inside that country. Um, I would also like to see us, um, uh, as my colleagues also indicated, strengthen the Palestinian Authority's role in Gaza. And I would like to see a much more emotive and personal shoulder-to-shoulder uh, -shoulder ally um, projection of the U.S.-Israel relationship. Yes, um, President Obama um, referred to Israel's right to defend itself, but there was still something lacking, in my view, which is that concept of firm shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder ally, which publicly it's important to project, even if quietly the United States is working behind the scenes to broker uh, diplomatic ceasefires and understandings. Uh, this is, uh, these are the views of uh, my colleagues here at the Washington Institute. Um, if you have questions or comments, please do email us. Thank you and goodbye.